The hollow of my hand was still ivory full of Lolita, full of the feel of her preadolescently incurved back, that ivory smooth, sliding sensation of her skin through the ding ding frock that I had worked up and down while I held her. I marched into her tumbled room, threw open the door of the closet and plunged into a heap of crumpled things that had touched her. There was particularly one pink texture, sleazy, torn with a faintly acrid odor in the steam. In the seam. I wrapped in it Humbert's huge engorged heart. A poignant chaos was welling within me, but I had to drop those things and hurriedly regain my composure as I became aware of the maid's velvety voice calling me softly from the stairs. She had a message for me, she said and topping my automatic thanks with a kindly you're welcome, good Louis left an unstamped, curiously clean-looking letter in my shaking hand. This is a confession. I love you. So the letter began, and for a distorted moment I mistook its hysterical scrawl for a schoolgirl's scribble. Last Sunday in church, but you who refused to come to see your beautiful new windows. Only last Sunday, my dear one, when I asked the Lord what to do about it, I was told to act as I'm acting now. You see, there is no alternative. I have loved you from the minute I saw you. I am passionate and lonely woman, and you are the love of my life. Now, my dearest, dearest, mon cher, je, mon, je monsieur, you have read this, now you know. So, will you please, at once, pack and leave? This is a landlady's order. I am dismissing a lodger. I am kicking you out. Go, scram, departez. I shall be back by dinner time, if I do eighty both ways and don't have an accident. But what would it matter? And I do not wish to find you in the house. Please, please, leave at once, now, do not even read this absurd note to the end, go, adieu. The situation, chérie, is quite simple, of course, I know with absolute certainty that I am nothing to you, nothing at all. Oh yes, you enjoy talking to me and kidding for me. You have grown fond of our friendly ho house, of the books I like, of my lovely garden, even of low's noisy ways, but I'm nothing to you, right? Right, nothing to you, whatever. But if, after reading my confession, you decided, in your dark romantic European way, that I am attractive enough for you to take advantage of my letter and make a pass at me, then you would be a criminal, worse than a kidnapper who rapes a child. You see, chérie, if you decided to stay, if I found you at home, which I know I won't, and that's why I'm able to go on like this. The fact of your remaining would only mean one thing, that you want me as much as I do you, a lifelong mate, and that you are ready to link up to your life with mine forever and ever, and be a father to my little girl. Let me rave and rumble on for a teeny while more, my dearest, since I know this letter has been by now torn by you, and its pieces illegible, in the vortex of the toilet, my dearest, mon très, très cher, what a world of love I have built up for you during this miraculous June. I know how reserved you are, how British your old world reticence, your sense of decorum may, have, may be shocked by the boldness of an American girl. You who conceal your strongest feelings must think me a shameless little idiot for throwing open my poor bruised heart like this. In years gone by, many disappointments came my way. Mr. Hayes was a splendid person, a sterling soul, but he happened to be twenty years my senior, and, well, let us not gossip about the past. My dearest, your curiosity must be well satisfied if you have ignored my request and read this letter to the bitter end. Never mind, destroy it and go. Do not forget to leave the key on the desk in your room, and some scrap of address 
so that I could refund the twelve dollars I owe you till the end of the month. Goodbye, dear one. Pray for me, if you ever pray. C.H. What I present here is what I remember of the letter, and what I remember of the letter I remember verbatim, including that awful French. It was at least twice longer. I have left out a lyrical passage, which I more or less skipped at the time, concerning Lolita's brother who died at two when she was four, and how much I would have liked him. Let me see what else can I say. Yes, uh, there is just a chance that the vortex of the toilet, where the letter did go, is my own matter-of-fact contribution. She probably begged me to make a special fire to consume it. My first movement was one of repulsion and retreat. My second was like a friend's calm hand falling upon my shoulder and bidding me take my time. I did. I came out of my daze and found myself still in Lowe's room. A full-page hat ripped out of a sleek magazine was affixed to the wall above the bed between a crooner's mug and the lashes of, of a movie actress. It represents a dark-haired young husband with a kind of drained look in his Irish eyes. He was modeling a robe by so-and-so and holding a bridge-like tray by so-and-so with breakfast for two. The legend by the Rev. Thomas Morell called him a conquer conquering hero. The thoroughly conquered lady, not shown, was presumably propping herself up to receive her half of the tray. How her bed fellow was to get under the bridge without some messy mishap was not clear. Lowe had drawn a jocose arrow to the haggard lover's face and had put in block letters H. H. And indeed, Despite a difference of a few years, the resemblance, resemblance was striking, and that this was another picture, also a colored ad. A distinguished playwright was solemnly smoking a drum. He always smoked drums. The resemblance was slight. Under this was Lowe's chaste bed, littered with comics. The enamel, enamel had come of the bedstead leaving black, more or less rounded marks on the white. Having convinced myself that Louis had left, I got into Lowe's bed and reread re the letter. <laughs>